Hello, hello, hello. <laughs> How are you guys doing today? It is currently 6 p.m. on Friday, and Alex just left for the airport. And before that, he was taking a nap. Well, he came home from work and took me to the grocery store. So I got all kinds of groceries for the weekend. Um, let's see, I got two packages of beets. I got more brie cheese, more brie cheese. I got more brie cheese and then I got a round of camembert cheese. And then I got four things of pasta salad. I got a bunch of coffee. I don't know if I'm gonna do this as like a short on my Peter Does Stuff channel or a TikTok or whatever, but I got stuff to make like a pumpkin cream cold brew at home with whipped cream. Um, Alex took me to Starbucks too and I got a pumpkin cream cold brew. And then what else did I get? I got chips and dip, because of course that's so healthy. And I got um, these chips that I did a review video of today, these Terra vegetable chips, they were horrible. And, um, well, the sweet potato ones weren't that bad, but I mean, they weren't like delicious. And then the just the beet and ones were not great. And then um, what else did I get? I got so much stuff. Some more coffee, iced coffee. Um, that Colombre coffee that I used to get like the big things of it, they now have like the small cans of like the lattes with oat milk in it. So I got the mocha and then I got just like the latte one. I got two of those. And then I got one lemonade, one little small lemonade. And then I got more American cheese for grilled cheeses. Oh, I got, well, some pumpkin stuff I can't show because I'm gonna do it in a review video. So different, like three different pumpkin spice flavored stuff. And then I got some blueberry muffins <laughs> so that I could have those around here for this weekend. So I'm totally ready for the grocery extravaganza, treat extravaganza. And the Radley's already been fed for the day and Alex just took him out for one last time and he was talking to him out here and then he picked, it was really sweet. He was like, let me pick you up so I can take you inside. And then he gave him a bunch of treats and stuff. and. And then he left. So um, Alex is off for San Diego. He gets into San Diego. I don't need like eleven something, which is like I don't, I don't even know. A ten, not a nine, maybe. I don't know. Anyway, he gets in late, so um, he's got a long night ahead of him. He was really tired from work today too. Um, I wasn't gonna film any videos. I thought we would just kind of like hang out. But when we got back from the grocery store, he said, I'm so tired, I'm gonna take a nap, do you care? And I was like, no, babe, take a nap. I know you're tired and you've got this trip ahead of you. So I filmed a Peterisms video, a long Peterisms video, it was like 16 minutes long. And then I ended up filming um, a review video of these potato chips. I honestly, I wasn't gonna film any videos today except for my vlog, because videos just don't do really that great on Fridays. And so I thought, if I'm going to take one day off this weekend, which I probably won't end up taking any days off because it's like Alex is gone. So there's not, I mean, I have the whole day to film videos. There's not really any, I mean, I'll at least film like a Peterisms and a vlog, you know what I mean? Or something like that. There's not really any reason not to film a video. Not. Um, so... I don't know, I might take a day off. It just depends on how I'm feeling or if I'm wanting to watch a TV show or something like that. It's kind of a little cold to be sitting out here watching television already. Um, I'm getting a taste of what this fall and winter is gonna be like. Um, last night, it got into the 40s. It was really, really cold outside. Um, like cold where I couldn't sit out here and watch TV. I actually forgot to post my vlog last night and then all of a sudden I was like, oh my God, I forgot to post my vlog and it was like super late. Um, and it was like ready to go at like 10 o'clock too. Um, so that's why the vlog was posted so late last night. But I am gonna get a space heater and um, out here. I'm gonna, when I, that's one of my things to do tonight is to, um, Google like outside space heaters and see what I can find that I can have like sitting out here on the front porch. But I also want it to be something that like I can unplug and like take inside. Like I don't want to leave it out here, you know? Um, just constantly. I just, <laughs> I just think that that kind of looks tacky a little bit <laughs> on my front porch to have like a space heater just sitting here. Anyway, um, 
but I am gonna get something like that. I mean, once I put on like sweats, I mean, I'm in, you know, a t-shirt and shorts, so right now, it's probably like upper 50s, and it's chilly outside, upper 50s, lower 60s, um, and it's chilly outside, but it's manageable, like I can do this, but I couldn't, like I wouldn't, and there's no breeze, but I wouldn't wanna sit out here for you know six hours and watch TV, but if I put on like sweatshirt, or, like uh, uh, sweatpants and like a sweatshirt, I probably would be okay. Now with the forty degree weather, I don't know. Like it was really cold outside last night, so I'm gonna test it probably, you know, tonight and see a little bit. But other other than that, I'll probably watch my TV shows inside. And Alex isn't here, so like I can watch like Netflix and stuff on the big screen TV inside all night long if I want to. So, um, gonna watch and finish Dahmer. And then, I don't know what I'm gonna watch next. I have like three or four shows that I wanna watch that I've been talking to people about. I've honestly been kind of, I need to trim my nails. Like one hand is like, it's weird like what nails grow longer than the rest. Like on this hand, I only need to like cut my index finger and like this finger. And on this hand, I don't need to cut any of my fingers. Do, I keep my, my fingernails pretty short. Do you guys keep yours pretty short? Um, not like short, like short, 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 but like I don't have like long fingernails whatsoever. If I was like, um, well, I shouldn't say if I'm a woman because there's a lot of men that get their nails done now too. Even before like men were like wearing, you know, nail polish and all that kind of stuff, which I have so much, so many colors of nail polish inside. And I remember I bought all that nail polish and I ended up not wearing any of it. But um, like, I think like I would be somebody that like went and got my nails done like once a week or once every other week. And I would be kind of like really weird about that. Like I grew up like my mom and my aunt and my grandma too. Like my grandma, she went to the, she would call it the beauty shop. She went to the beauty shop every week and got like a roller set and got her nails painted. And they were always painted like bright red was like the color that she got them painted. And um, my grandma always, always, always had like really nice, perfect nails. In fact, I, I don't know why I remember this, but when my grandma died, I remember like, I was so resistant to like going up and seeing like my grandma in the casket and I, and Caroline and I were supposed to get there after they closed the casket and then they decided to leave it an open casket. And I ended up going up there and um, I remember my mom or my aunt saying something about my grandma's like nails looking so nice. Isn't that such a weird memory that I have? And they were like, grandma's nails look so nice. And her nails, I mean, I remember them like being like always perfect. Speaking of which, my mom and I have this kind of mutual friend and she just texted me and just she really helped, this woman really helped out a lot when my mom was sick and she would come over here and she would like do crossword puzzles with her. This was before my mom went in the hospital and um, well this was between two hospital visits and this was also before my mom went in the hospital um, the last time. And so she would come over here so my mom went in the hospital and then they released her and they said that they diagnosed her with dehydration. What, okay, this is what's really interesting. So my mom ended up going to this one hospital here in Indianapolis, which doesn't exist anymore. They ended up, uh, it's now Eskenazi in, in Indianapolis. At the time it was Wishard Hospital. And um, my mom went there um, because of this healthcare plan that she was on that was like similar to like Medicare, but not, it was called the Hoosier Insurance Plan. And it was for like people between a certain age that didn't have healthcare. But you had to go through this hospital system if you were gonna like, to get like diagnosed and whatever. So my mom went there and this was when she very first got sick and she got all these tests run and whatever. And they diagnosed her with the disease that she ended up passing away from. I don't know Every time I say this in a video, somebody corrects me because I don't know what it's called today, but they changed the name of it. Um, when my mom got diagnosed with it, so I'm not trying to offend anybody, I'm just telling you what it was called when my mom was diagnosed with it. It was called Wegener's vasculitis granulatosis. And um, I think the reason they don't call that anymore is because 
it was somebody that was like not a good German, if you know what I mean. Um, that 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 name, and so they call it something different now. Is my understanding of why they call it that. But anyway, um, so she got diagnosed with that um, at Wishard Hospital. Well, then the sicker that she got. My dad wasn't like ever in charge of her case, but he wanted to be able to like be connected with the doctors in case like to talk to me or to talk to my aunt that he could be like the go-between to like tell us like, okay, this got this doctor, you know, here's like how to get a hold of him or whatever. And so they ended up, my mom ended up getting him, getting admitted to the hospital um, system that my dad worked for. Well, for some reason, the paperwork never got, I, it didn't get sent or I don't know what happened. But anyway, my mom didn't get diagnosed with this until like a long time afterwards at this hospital system. It, it, the thing is, is like they did a full autopsy when my mom passed away. It wouldn't have changed anything because by then her body was riddled with this. And, um, you know, like my dad was the one that really pushed for an autopsy. He was like, your mom would want you to do this because if anybody else can be saved by something that they find from an autopsy, you know, she would, you know, so they did an autopsy on my mom and um, what they found was that at that point, so she died of kidney failure, but it had like gone through her entire body at that point. So like it, her entire body was riddled with this. Um... So anyway, but when she first got admitted to the hospital the first time, they just thought she was dehydrated and they filled her with fluids and they kept her for like two or three days and they discharged her with dehydration. But she was like still really, really sick and so, and weak. And so she came back here and that was where my aunt set up like 24 hour care, like not literally, like we didn't have like a paid nurse here or anything like that, but like 24 hours there were people here, like either me or this friend that I'm talking about, she was here a lot, or like recovery friends of my mom's or my aunt or other people would come over here and bring food to my mom. And at that point she was just like eating like Jello, cottage cheese, drinking a lot of water, but she really wouldn't eat a whole lot. Like, I mean, she lost so much weight like in such a short period of time because she really wouldn't eat anything. And so, or drink anything. And so, um, this woman came over here a lot during that time. Well, then, and then my mom got readmitted to the hospital when she fell and was unconscious in the shower. That's at the point where they found out the diagnosis of what was going on. And then they started treating that. Um, and then my mom went into a coma and never came out of it. So th that was like the whole thing that came out of it. She came out of it one time. Um, But that's like a whole other story. But anyway, um, how long was she in the hospital before she went into a coma? I think she was in the hospital like maybe two weeks, three weeks, something like that. Because there was a situation that happened that, no, she never did come. I'm like, did that happen before she went in the coma? Isn't it strange that I can't remember? And it's, I, I think to myself, it's been almost 15 years, you know? It's a long time. Anyway, so this friend would come over here and she would like read to my mom and they would do crossword puzzles together and watch movies and stuff together a lot. And um, so she just texted me. And then, and then, so she became friends through that with one of my mom's dearest friends from high school. It was like, if my mom had three friends from high school that she was friends with her entire life. And like, like her closest core friends in life were probably three friends from high school. Really two friends, Diane and Nancy. Those were her two friends and Diane had died before her. So Nancy was the only one left. And then my mom's friend Susie from college was like her diehard college friend. You know, those were like my mom's core group friends from through her entire life. Well, Nancy, who lived in New York for a long time, when they all went to college, she ended up working for the Federated Stores in New York City, and she ended up coming here, coming back here, and 
Um, so she helped out a lot when my mom was sick and she was really involved with all of that. So Nancy and this woman became friends. Well, this woman who I haven't talked to in years, she just texted me and she said that Nancy had passed away last week. And I was just telling Alex because like I, you know, I've never really talked about Nancy to him. And I said, I just found out that one of my mom's really good friends passed away. And, um, he was like, well, was this somebody that you knew? And I said, oh yeah, like. I mean, she was around from, like, the day that I was born. I remember she had really, really red hair, like, naturally red hair. She looked like Julianne Moore a lot. And I remember she was real sophisticated, and she was a buyer for Bonwit Teller and Lord and & Taylor for a long time. And I always remember thinking that, like, I would tell everybody that my mom's best friend was, like, a, a buyer in New York City. Because I thought that was, like, the coolest thing, you know? And um, she would come to our house to, to stay and visit, and um, she would sit on, like, our porch with my mom, and she would just, like, smoke these cigarettes, and she just, I always thought that she was so cool, and she was so sweet, and um, it's, like, weird, you know, like, I was, uh, like, Caroline doesn't know her, like, nobody... Like, I don't, Susie doesn't even really know her, you know, to, like, Susie was my mom's college friend, so it's like, it's weird when you kind of start getting to the age where, like, really big stuff happens. And there's not really anybody to call and tell or talk to about it. I mean, I have people that talk to about it, like Tanya and my sponsor and stuff like that, but... You know, I remember sharing this, like, a couple years ago on my blog. Where I would say... You know, it's hard when you get to a certain point where there's nobody there, really, that... Um, my dad... I didn't even think about calling my dad. <laughs> I don't know why. I mean, he's been so far removed from all of that, from, you know, my mom's friends for so long, but he, he was good friends with her when they were married. Um, it's hard as you get older when... The people that knew your growing up or your past or know your story are gone. There's nobody that really knows your story anymore, you know? It's a, it's a really lonely feeling, honestly. It's like, you know, I don't have any siblings to share that stuff with. Caroline and I, like, as close as Caroline and I are... Like, it, there's a limited shared history because, well, first of all, we were very, very close when we were younger, and then there was a gap. Like, when I was in high school, she was in high school and college. Um, but then also... Like, my mom had her own group of friends. My aunt had her group of friends. They had overlapping friends, right? But, like, Caroline doesn't know my mom's friends. Like, I'll, I'll mention somebody to Caroline, and she'll say, I don't know who you're talking about. Or she'll say something to me, and I'll be like, I have no clue who that person is, right? So, there's a lot of people that we don't know um, from our own mothers, you know? And, uh... <laughs> Yeah, I just don't have those people to share those stories with. I don't have, like, my mom, like, most of my mom's friends are gone. Or, you know, like, I, they're just only parts of certain parts of her life where they don't remember tons of it. I don't know, it's just, it's hard, you know? Even, like, with, I think it's hard, like, God, I'm gonna get teary-eyed again. Like, even like with Tanya and I, you know. I 
Like, Tanya and I have been friends for so long. And, like, we were talking to somebody the other night when we were at our meeting afterwards. And we were talking about somebody that's, like, a really good friend of ours that doesn't live here anymore. And, but she used to go to our home group meeting for years, you know. And this person's been coming for, like, a long time. Like, been around, like, this person we were talking to. And, um, I don't know why I'm getting so emotional about this. But... This woman was like, I don't, do I know her? Do, I don't know who that person is, have I? And we were both like, no, you wouldn't know her because like, you know, she moved and then like you came in like a couple years after. Her. And it's like, it's so weird that like, two of my sponsors are gone. Three of my sponsors are gone. You know, my Second, I don't even know where my first sponsor is because I had him for such a short period of time, but I don't even really count him. But my second sponsor that really helped me work steps the first time he died of a heroin overdose. And then my sponsor, Mike, passed away last year. And then the sponsor that I had for um, the longest time, he just passed away. You know, he's the one that I just went to his funeral. And it's like, all these people, like I was thinking this guy, this friend of mine, who's older than me, he's probably older than me by at least 10 years. He just got 32 years sober. But like ever since I've been coming to meetings, like he's been there. Like I remember him like the day I walked into like going to this home group. He's actually the guy that, <laughs> it's a funny story, so... The meeting that I go to on Tuesday nights has a speaker meeting on Sunday nights that has like a sister meeting. It has actually a literature group on Thursday nights and a, and a speaker meeting on Sunday nights. And so that's kind of like all connected. And so at the time that I started going back to meetings, if you don't know my story, there were four years that I didn't go to meetings. I was just like, I, I didn't drink and I didn't use drugs, but I was going out to bars and just like with Alex all the time going out to bars and I had no spiritual foundation and no emotional sobriety and I just was miserable, hateful, angry, sad. I just was, it, it was like, when they talk about a dry drunk, like I was a dry drunk. Like I was, the only thing in my life was that I wasn't drinking and quite frankly, I probably would have been happier if I was. But I'm very happy that I held on to my sobriety. Um, so I did that for four years and I can, I would just sit out here on this front porch and I would just play um, like solitaire on my phone. And I remember Alex came out here at one point and he was like, I don't, something like, he said something like, I don't know what I can do to help you, but I can't continue to like live like this. Like you're so miserable. And, um, I was in the kitchen one day and I was standing there. I was making a list, like writing a list. Like I was completely fine. Right. Like, and I was like, this was when we had carpet before. This is, so this is a long time ago. It's been like nine or 10 years ago now. So, um, I mean, it would have been four years into our relationship, so that I didn't go to meetings. So this is, it might have been one year prior in the first three years that we were together. So, um, so I might be, it might have been like 11 years that I've been going back to meetings pretty actively. And I came back like a newcomer, like I got super involved really quick and, you know, was like working steps and service and all that kind of stuff and going to meetings. But anyway, so I was sitting there and I was making a list of things to do for that day. And I was like, vacuum. <laughs> That's why I said we had, because we have hard floors now, hard slate and wood floors now, but um, not carpet. And I was like, vacuum, laundry, fold laundry make bed or something like that. I got to like the fourth thing and I just lost it. Like I just absolutely lost it and started bawling. And I was like, I, 
I can't function. Like, I, honest to God, like, I cannot function. And I can't even do these m mundane things that I need to do with my life. Like, I just, uh, I didn't know how to go forward. I didn't know what to do. It wasn't just depression. It wasn't, and I'm not saying that recovery programs fix everything because we are strong believers in outside issues that you need outside help for things. And there, there's only certain things that 12-step programs can help with, right? That's not to say that you're not going to get better if you have mental health issues and go to a 12-step program. It's just to say it's not the end all, okay? That we also need talk therapy and counseling and therapists and all that, psychiatrists and things like that. Many of us, not all. Um, but it was like, my life was just, I didn't know what to do. And I think I was really close to not caring anymore as well. And... <sighs> With the grace of God, I picked up the phone and I called Tanya. And I'll never forget, I said, bawling. I said, will you please take me to a meeting? And she said, I've been praying for four years for you to ask me that. Or she said, I think, I think she said, I've been praying every day for four years for you to ask me that. So it was a Tuesday night and she said, do you want to go to the name of our home group? And I said, oh, no, I'm not going back there. Because I had left kind of like on a bad note <laughs> with this guy that is, like, such a good dear friend of mine. Um, and I love his girlfriend. And he's just, like, such a good friend of ours. And, like, he and I had kind of gotten into this, like, argument. And, um, and he, like, I used him as an excuse to not go to meetings for a while. I was like, F him, F him, and I don't care. And if those people are going to be this way and whatever... <laughs> So I had kind of like shown my ass a little bit to my home group meeting. So I didn't want to go back there. I definitely wasn't going back there. So we ended up going to uh, this uh, recovery club, clubhouse, where they have a lot of meetings. And it was a great meeting that night. There was like four or five of us. That was it. It's like Tanya and I and like three other people. And one of the other, there was this woman in there. And she was like in her mid twenty, early 20s that I had known for a long time. And she hadn't been to meetings in like three or four years either. And so that was kind of the topic of the conversation. And it was, I just felt like I was back, you know. And so it's funny because that night, Tani and I, you know, we went and got a fountain pop like we used to do back in the day. Because that had always been something that we had done. We'd go to a meeting, get a fountain pop, you know, sit around her fire pit and whatever outside. And, um, and you know... I didn't really think, like, Tanya and I stayed friends during all that time that I didn't go to meetings, but I didn't really think about, like, Tanya was kind of left to her own devices, like, at the time that I stopped going to meetings, you know, two people moved away, two people stopped going to North Side meetings, like, in Indianapolis, and so it's like, Tanya was just left on her own, you know, to kind of fend for herself and go to meetings, and it was a lonely t time for Tanya, like, I didn't, and I, did, I wasn't aware of that, like, she wasn't saying that to me, you know? So we get back to her house and so we go inside and we're telling Eric about, you know, the meeting and how great it was and everything like that. And hi. And I said, Tanya, I got real excited I, because in Indianapolis, there are 400 meetings a week, give or take. And um, with just this one program. And um, I mean, there's probably. Oh, between Alcoholics Anonymous, Narcotics Anonymous, Cocaine Anonymous, Heroin Anonymous, um, and those are like the top four, I would say, substance abuse, 12-step uh, programs in Indianapolis, there's probably six to 700 meetings a week, 800 meetings a week. I mean, so there's a lot of meetings here. And so, I mean, in a, one given day, there's 30 meetings. And a lot of these clubhouses, of which there's like four or five in Indianapolis clubhouses depending on what side of town you're on. So there's like, you know, the South Side Club. Okay. So there's like different clubs. They have meetings at like 7.30, 9, noon, 4, 8. So you could just sit there and go to meetings all day long. When I first got sober, that was like really helpful for me. And this is not just in Indianapolis. Like most cities have these clubs. Like I've, like, cause I've heard a lot of people that have moved here from other cities or um, when I talk to people from other cities, I'll say like, they call them the club, like the Serenity Club or, you know, like the One Day at a Time Club or whatever. They're always called names like that. But anyway, not always. I mean, sometimes they're called like the areas of town. It doesn't matter. But anyway, 
So I knew that there was like always like a noon meeting. And I said to Tanya, I said, I'm gonna go to the noon. It stopped. So I said to, to Tanya, we were standing there. I said, I'm gonna go to the noon meeting tomorrow. Do you wanna go with me? And she said, you know, she said, <laughs> for the four years that I have, that you've been missing or not going to meeting, she said, I've continued to go to meeting. So she said, I'm pretty good, but it'll be good for you to go to that meeting tomorrow by yourself. And I said, oh. Okay, because I don't, I still to this day, I don't like going to meetings by myself that I've never been to before. It makes me really nervous. Well, that's my social anxiety. I just don't like to walk into any situation th that I don't know what, you know what I mean? Like, even if it's a meeting. And um, so I walked into that meeting, and I'll never forget, I sat down to this woman that I ended up, like I said, becoming really good friends with. And, um, hello? It's your evening walk. Yeah. Hey, 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 no snow yet. Not yet. <laughs> um, but I sat down next to this woman. I've shared this story before, so there's probably a lot of you out here that know this. But I sat down next to this woman. And so the way that this meeting was set up was that there was like these two long tables. And so it would be like long table, long table, long table, long table. And then there were chairs all the way around the room. And um, so it, there was like 40 people that would sit in this meeting and it was packed. And so I sat down next to her and um, she said, and there was like two chairs and I sat down the one right next to her and she said, do you mind moving over? She said, I'm holding that chair for a friend. And I said, no, not at all, whatever. And so I, I moved one chair over <laughs> and I'm sitting there and I'm, the meeting's getting ready to start and lo and behold, <laughs> My friend loves when I tell this story. Lo and behold, right at noon, like or two after or something, who walks in? The guy that was the reason why I walked out to begin with. And where does he sit? Right next to me. And that's who she was saving the chair for. So anyway, he looks over at me about, I don't know, it was at the beginning of the meeting or halfway through the meeting or something, but he looked over at me and he goes, um, I think I owe you an amends. Can we talk after the meeting? And... Um, we had such an amazing conversation. You know, and he took responsibility for things and he had gone back out and started using again and could have died and came back in. And he took responsibility and made amends to me and I made amends to him. And today we're such good friends, you know, and I feel so blessed for that. Um... But this guy that had 32 years sober, my friend, like when I came in, I always just thought he had 30 years, you know what I mean? Like, I mean, he doesn't look old. He looks five or 10 years, he looks 10 years older than me, right? But I always just thought that he had 30 years, you know, like he just always looked to me like, I always just, like there's a lot of these guys that like, you know, if you walk in, and women too, but like you walk in and on, you know, you're like five days sober. So anybody that has like a year or two, you think has like 30 years, you know what I mean? So I was sitting there doing the math and I was like, okay, 27, 32, like, like we're less than five years difference in sobriety. Like it had never really occurred to me that way. Like he had less than five years when I walked into the program and I was like, that is crazy. Like I honest to God thought he had like 20, not that it doesn't make any difference, but I was like, I thought he had 20 years, you know? So when I was going to the speaker meeting, that was like the sister meeting to my home group, I wasn't, I still wasn't going to my home group and Tanya wasn't either. I was like, no, I'm not going back to that meeting and those people are talking, you know. I was so afraid of walking back into that meeting because I was so afraid that of what people would say. I was ashamed of how I had acted. I was, I thought people were gonna be like, where have you been? Like, uh, you know. And, um, so a couple times he said to me, like, when are you coming back to, you know, our home group? When are you coming back to our home group? Because he chaired this speaker meeting. And I said, oh, I don't know, whatever. So one night, it was after the meeting. <clears throat> He's a tall guy, really nice guy. And has always been so loving and kind to me super masculine just kind of like arm around your shoulders you know <laughs> like let's we're gonna go over here and talk for a second and he goes i'm gonna talk to you about something here for a second i said okay 
I was like trying to dart out the door, you know? And he goes, when are you coming back to our home group? This was on a Sunday, right? And I go, well, like, you know, I'm... he goes, I'm going to see you there on Tuesday. And I said, what? And he goes, I'm going to see you there on Tuesday. You're coming on Tuesday. Because we would love to see you. And I was like, okay. And it's kind of a thing in recovery that if you're asked to do something, you don't say no. And so, um, I told Tanya, she was down for it. I mean, she wanted to go anyway. She, like, missed that group, you know? So, we went that Tuesday, and everybody was fantastic, you know? Everybody was just like, it's so good to see you. And we missed you, and, um, but, you know, like, going to that meeting previous, for the 12 or whatever, 14 years before that I had gone to that meeting, I don't even know how long I've gone to that meeting before, but, like, I would come with Tanya and, like, you know, our two or three other, like, friends and whatever, and, like, I wasn't real talkative with people, and I would, I would share in meetings, but, like, briefly, I didn't go up to, you know, newcomers and, like, shake their hand and introduce myself. I didn't go up to people that I didn't know and talk at all. So, you know, like, afterwards, like, after a meeting, I would just kind of, like, stand there and just, like, wait for them to be ready to go and stuff. And so when I came back in, I was like, I'm doing this different this time. Like, I'm going to introduce myself to people. I'm going to introduce myself to the newcomer. And, you know, and it's so hard for me because of my social anxiety. But, like, I have made such fantastic friends in recovery because I have forced myself to go up to people and be like, you know, I don't know you very well. And, like, I almost kind of have to fake it till I make it a little bit. But as a result of that, you know, or like even in meetings, share about how bad my social anxiety is and how hard it is for people, for me to meet people. And, you know, I'll share that and then somebody will come up to me and be like, thank you for sharing that. I, I have the, ex I share the exact same thing, right? Or, you know, I experience the exact same thing. And um, I, I think the thing that really made a difference for me was when I was going to meetings, like my first uh, year back. And I was going to, like, almost every night I was going, or every day I was going to a 12 o'clock meeting, and they call it the Nooner. The 12 o'clock, I don't like that name. The Nooner, I was going to the Nooner, and I was going to an 8 o'clock meeting. And I would walk in those meetings, and this was at the club. So this was at the clubhouse, and it was like, for the noon meeting, you see, the majority of the people that you see are the same people every single day. There are a lot of people that have just gotten out of treatment or in outpatient programs, a lot of people that aren't working, things like that. A lot of older people that are retired and whatever. Well, when you go to the same meeting five days a week and you're seeing the same people five days a week, it's hard to not get to know people right away very quickly. So within a month, I knew everybody. And I would walk into that room and people would be like, hey, Peter, oh, it's so good to see you. Hey, how are you? Like, I want to talk to you about something afterwards. And I felt very much a part of something, which I think is something that I never felt before. You know, I was talking to my friend Valerie last night about this. We were talking about, like, high school. And she was telling me, she was like, yeah, we, like, like, I knew this guy that was, like, gay in high school. Like, we never said he was gay, but we just kind of always assumed it, you know. And she was like, you know, um, he even asked somebody to prom, and even though we knew that he didn't like her and all this kind of stuff. But, like, you know, we wanted him to be a part of something. Honest to God, that's not something that I figured out till late in life. I don't regret the choice of friends that I had in high school, you know, because the kind of outsiders that I had as friends were the only people that really wanted me to be around. I lacked any kind of confidence to put myself into any groups or clubs or anything like that. I was so afraid because I had just been so horribly bullied for so many years that anybody that was willing to have me or take me, like I was willing to be there, you know? And that's really why I had the friends that I did, which ended up being a group of badass girls that protected my ass at any expense. What is on my shirt? I was watching my drama video back yesterday and it's like I had this like pink string from my fan just like on my shirt the whole time. I'm like, I hate when that happens. And I'm so grateful for those girls, you know? I'm so incredibly grateful. Not to mention that we had some fantastic times together. But I think had I gotten more involved, I think had I, I don't know, done drama or 
been in choir, because those were things that I was kind of interested in, but was too afraid to pursue, or got involved in some kind of club, or just tried a little harder to be involved a little bit. You know, when people say, oh, I don't have any regrets in life, I do kind of have some regrets in that. I think it would have made my high school years a little different. You know, it's like a th that movie, Prince of Tides, which I love that movie, and that, well, I haven't read the book, but I love, I think Mel read all of those books by Pat Conroy. But I love that movie so much. And when he's about to, you know, he has the affair with Barbara Streisand, and then he goes home to his wife. And as he's driving over that bridge, he's, he's thinking about Barbara Streisand, but he's going back to his wife. And he says, if for every man there were two lives. Basically meaning, like, you, you, you have to make choices in life. You know, I loved... You know, my friend, when I was writing my book, she referred to us all as, like, this gang of freaks. Like, I loved my gang of freaks that I hung out with. <sighs> we were survivors. We persevered. We had fun together. But I also wonder who Peter would have been that was... Because I think I would have been popular. I think, like, and not that I really care about being popular, but I think I would have been liked. I think I would have been accepted had I tried a little bit harder and fit in. I don't know. Like, I think the bullying would have stopped and people would have been like... I don't, I don't blame myself or take responsibility for being bullied. That's not my doing. But I do think that had I, like... I don't know, just put myself into the middle of living a little bit. I think it would have looked so different. I think... You know, it's like I watch these movies like Perks of Being a Wallflower and like they go to football games and stuff. Like I never went to one football game. Never went to one pep rally. Never went to one dance. I feel like I'm totally fine for it. <laughs> like I don't feel like I like really missed out on anything. Can I say that, like, when I watch a show like Pretty Little Liars, the new one, or if I watch, you know, like, a show like Love, Victor, or something like that, like, I don't ever, or, like, Simon vs. The Home Savings Agenda, I don't wish that I had gone to, like, a school dance. I can't say that. I can't say that I don't wish that I went to a school dance, because I do sometimes, you know? I feel like maybe I missed out a little bit. Look at these three teenage girls walking in the neighborhood. They're like, they're like 14 years old and they're like walking through and they're like sucking on lollipops and like looking on their phones and stuff like that with hoodies on. They're probably having a sleepover tonight and they're, get, they're getting all crazy in the old people's neighborhood. But no, like I do kind of, you know, it's like, do I think it would have changed the direction of my life? I don't know. You know, there's another part of me that wishes I wasn't so afraid and had taken my art more seriously and gone to New York City to pursue fashion. I also, but I do think, like, had I pursued that line, I think my drinking and drugging would have been my downfall very quickly in a city like New York City. Um, I often think, like, had I gone to a college campus... Like, what would the result have been? I think it would have resulted in me drinking and using so much that I got kicked out or put on probation after one semester. That's what I think it would have looked like. I think me living in Indianapolis, going to a city school, was kind of a saving grace to some degree. Um... And I also am a believer that, you know, those things that happen to us in life are the reasons why we end up where we do, you know? And I'm grateful for my life. I love my life. And I'm grateful for the people in it, you know? And I think about... I think about all the people that... You know, like, there's this girl that I was really, really dear friends with for about a year and a half. And I'm not friends with her at all anymore. Like, she had a falling out with a close friend that I ha that of mine. So, um, I, she and I didn't stop being friends, but she kind of started hanging out with a whole other friend friend group, 
and then I stopped seeing her, and of course, you know, I started, I continued to see my friend, because I'm loyal to her. So, and she and I now, like, we, like, we'll talk every once in a while and comment on people, or each other's stuff and whatever, but, um, she and I were out at this bar Talbot Street one night, and we were just standing there, and it was a dead night. Like, I mean, it was a Sunday night. We were watching a drag show, and there was probably, I mean, maybe 30 people in the whole bar. And it was this one waiter, bartender's birthday. And this really cute guy, like, ran up as this guy was, like, joking, bending over, and started swatting his butt and giving him birthday spanks. And I was like, who is that? And it was my husband, Alex. And um, I just happened to be looking through somebody's MySpace and saw Alex's picture come up. I was like, there's that cute guy that I saw give him birthday spanks. And I sent him a message, you know. And I, I would never have, that would never have happened had I not been with her, you know. So I believe there's this, you know, string of connectivity through life that, you know. I am a believer that people come into our lives for a reason, a season, or a lifetime as well. And I'm grateful for all of the people that have come into my lives. You know, I'm not that person. And I, and I have to honestly say, I haven't always been this way, like with dating people. I'd like to say that I've always been this way, but like, it, it's the easiest to, to use it with dating people, but with failed, failed, with friendships have, have gone awry or with anything, it's like this as well, right? It's like, I try not to look back on those friendships. Like, you know when, like, you'll have the friend and they break up with, like, a guy or a girl or whatever, and they'll be like, none of it was real. Like, it was all fake, right? And it's like, no, that's not true. Like, there were some really genuinely good times that you guys had, you know? They weren't just pictures for Facebook. Like, you guys had really, really good times. Just because it didn't end the way that you wanted it to end, you know, doesn't mean... Alex and I were talking today about... Um, I had ran into this, this uh, girl that we're friends with... And we knew she and her uh, husband, before they were even married, we knew them as, like, boyfriend-girlfriend. And then they um, ended up, like, getting married and getting divorced within, like, two years. And now he's married to a friend of ours, and we've, like, ran into him at restaurants and weddings and stuff. And, like, they're super happy and whatever. And, like, have a house and, you know, all this kind of stuff. And, um... And she's single and travels a lot and lives a wild life and she's super happy, right? And, you know, Alex and I were talking and he said, well, he always wanted to be, like, really settled down and she always wanted to just kind of, like, go out and party and all that kind of stuff and there's nothing wrong with that, right? Um, it's just, like, what is it that you want, you know? And I think that doesn't mean that it didn't necessarily work. It, meant, it means, like, maybe kind of, like, finding, you know, what it is that, you know... How did I get on that subject? But I think it's also about communicating and talking about all of that as well, you know? But I'm grateful for, like, every person that came into my life for, you know, like, just the lessons. Oh, I know what I was going to say. That I, that's why I'm a believer in a, people come into our lives for a reason, a season, or a lifetime, you know? I think, and I don't think we always know who those lifetime people are, you know? It's like, I was watching... The real, I think it was the Real Housewives of Atlanta, like these clips, and it was these like six times that Sheree and Nene really got into it, and there was like this part of this reunion, and Andy said, well, Nene, you and Sheree were really, really good friends for a long time, right? And Nene was like, yeah, for a long time. And I thought, that would be so sad if like something happened between Tanya and I. There was like some big gathering down here, because it's like all these cars parked on the street, but it's like a lot of older people. I can't tell if it's like a neighborhood gathering, if they're having a block party and I wasn't invited or <laughs> no. <laughs> you know I wouldn't go anyway, probably. But anyway, um, I was like, that would be so sad if something happened with Tanya and I and we weren't able to get through it, you know? And then this 25 year friendship that I had with her coming up on 26 years, this 25, 26 year friendship that I had with her just, just was over, you know? Like, I can't even think about that. And, um, and I don't want to think about it. And I won't think about it. Thankfully, you know, Tanya and I, we've really only had 
one major argument in our friendship. I will say, like, in the last couple years, we've had, like, disagreements about things where we see things differently. And it's really amazing how those conversations go. Like, you know, like, I'll bring it to her and I'll say, like, you know, Tanya, like, it really kind of hurt my feelings when you said things this way. And, you know, she'll say, well, that was never my intention. Or, you know, like, well, let's talk about it. Like, what specifically did I say that hurt your feelings? And she'll say, well, you know, I'm really sorry. Like, I, you know, I stand by what I have to say but I won't do it again or, you know, whatever, and vice versa. I mean, like, you know, she'll say something to me and be like, I know that that's not what you meant, but the way that you said it hurt or, you know, we are able to be able to, and maybe that's 20 year, 25 years of a friendship. I don't know. But we're able to have those conversations. It's like Alex and I, you know, after 14 years and two different marriage counselors at this point, you know, being able to, like we were talking about something in our marriage counseling session on um, Monday, it wasn't even that big of a deal, but our counselor said, do you know what's amazing is he said, you guys don't even raise your voices or get angry about what was it that we were talking about? And he said, this is a conversation that if I was having with most couples and couples counseling, they would definitely be raising their voices or getting very angry with each other. And he was like, you know, that shows how much previous work that you've done before you came in here. And I was like, you know, and I was thinking in that moment, it's like, well, thank you for the, the pat on the back and the praise. We're a perfect couple. No. But um, it's always interesting to me when people put couple goals, like when I put a picture up of Alex and I or whatever. I mean, like, don't get me wrong. I love that. <laughs> it makes me feel very good, right? But it's like, I don't know. Like, I mean, couple goals, like, we have had our bad days. I mean, we have shouted and screamed at each other and, you know, had so many marriage counseling sessions that we probably bought them houses at this point. And, you know, but like, it's so much work, but the work is worth it. It's been so worth it, you know? So that when a counselor says to us, like, that is a sign of the work that you've done before, is that you're able to have these conversations and not get upset with each other or yell and scream, and you're able to just say, well, this is how I feel, and then, you know, Alex can say, well, I appreciate that you feel this way, but I don't feel the same way, and whatever, we can have that conversation. Those are uh, eight times out of ten the way that the conversations go at our house. There are times that we don't see eye to eye. I will tell you that now that we have another marriage counselor in, in place again, if it ever starts escalating our go-to responses, let's save this for a counseling session. That's where we go with it. If it ever gets to a point where we think it's going to ruin a night, a weekend, or that we're going to end up yelling at each other, we always say, I think this has gotten too heated. Let's save this for marriage counseling. And that's what we always do. Um, and that's why I'm so thankful for the fact. And that's where you, like... It's like if you have a vocal coach and you're singing a song and it's like you keep on hitting that note, right? That you can't get right. Well, that's what you're going to take your vocal coach to work on. It doesn't mean like in marriage counseling that you're you're going to have this perfect. You're going to get an A plus and graduate and have this perfect marriage. Um, I love going to counseling. He's helped me so much. He's such a great guy. He's such a great guy. We've been so blessed to have two counselors that are really, really incredible. <laughs> I said to him, I said to him because our last one uh, retired. And he was young, too. He was like Alex's age. And he retired. And he was like full time. I mean, he was like, he saw like 10 clients a day. He retired because he got his dream job, which was like, he and a friend or something. I don't know. They like. He got hired as, like, the contracting foreman to flip houses. I mean, it was like they were going to make a lot of money off this. But, like, he always dreamed on, like, flipping houses and stuff. So, like, he, like, closed down his... Like, he stopped being, like, a, a therapist and everything. He had all these, like... I mean, he was all trained and all kinds of stuff. And he just, like, one day was like, nope, I'm going to be, like, I'm going to flip house. I was like, more power to you. I think that's great. So, I said... So, I can't remember how I said it, but I said it to my therapist... Like, probably pretty early on, like, the third or fourth session, I was explaining that about him. And I said, so, like, you're not planning on, like, quitting for your dream job or anything like that anytime soon. And he goes, well, this is kind of my my dream job. And I go, okay, good. <laughs> and then he goes, except. And I was like, no, you can't say that. You can't say that. So, anyway, um, I think it's important to have just, like, a good fit, you know, with the therapist. What am I? I'm, like, just rambling at this point. I don't even know what I'm talking about. I've talked about, I've talked almost an hour, you guys. Can you even believe it? 
Tonight I'm gonna watch Dahmer, like I said, and I don't know what I'm gonna have for dinner yet. I'm not sure. I might have some chips and dip. I might have some beets and some camembert cheese or brie. I haven't had camembert cheese in forever, but it comes in a roll. It, does it taste like brie? Like, I don't honestly remember. Does it taste like brie? Is camembert brie? Is it a type of brie? Like, I don't know. I was really hungry yesterday for a grilled cheese, just a regular grilled cheese and tomato soup or a peanut butter sandwich and tomato soup. So I might make that um, on my sandwich maker. We'll see. <laughs> Does anybody know if you toast the bread first and then put it on the sandwich maker, if that makes it any better? Or does that, is it like just, it's whatever. It's not any big deal. I'm trying to stretch this out to make it to an hour because I wanted to like make an hour long vlog for you guys, but I think I'm just gonna get off here now because <laughs> you can tell I'm stretching it out, can't you? Let's stretch it out. Look at that muscle, oh my lord. <laughs> not <laughs> muscle. <laughs> anyway, muscles down here are fun the other way. <laughs> That's gonna be, okay. Listen, 2022, 23 right now is going to be the year for like working out, getting into shape. <laughs> Not. <laughs> no, it has to be. It has to be because I keep on saying that. So anyway, I was like, I went to my doctor's office and he goes, you've kept the weight off. And I said, thanks for noticing. He goes, no, you know, and then my cousin the other day, she was like, how do you, or no, Tanya said to me the other night, she said, how do you keep the weight off? I said, I have no idea. I said, I am not eating healthy at all, but like I have kept the weight off, which is crazy, you know? Um, so is there anything else I was going to share? I don't think so. All right, you guys. <laughs> so I really want to make this an hour. I haven't vlogged for an hour in so long. I would be so proud of myself. What's another story that I can tell you guys? Okay, about today. Let's see. What else did I do today? Well, <laughs> by the time that I get inside, I think... I was going to say that Alex will have taken off, but that's not true because we're like 40 minutes to the airport. So he'll have probably just been there like 20 minutes. Oh my God. He was so proud of himself. He texted me and he was like, um, uh, he was like, I can't believe that I got like all, like he is taking a carry on bag, like a, like a duffel bag like this big and then he has you know just a regular like samson we have these samsonite bags i would love to does have any of you out there this is a question for you invested in those very expensive like, like the one brand is called away but they're like those really nice like carry-on bags that you like pull on a left you know what i'm talking about like we have the samsonite ones we got them at kohl's <laughs> matching ones um i got them for a trip a couple years ago that i went when i went to florida but do you guys know what i'm talking about like okay have any of you invested if you want to admit to it in the very expensive ones like they have some that are like 300 and then they have others that are like 2500 would you like are they lightweight do you like them do you which brand do you like because i really want to look into one of those um, so anyway, he was so proud of himself because he got five outfits and ten pairs of shoes. I don't even, maybe it was ten pairs of shoes and five outfits. No, it was like a lot of shoes and all of that in this carry-on bag. Or I mean in this, uh, this, what do you call it? This, yeah, the carry-on like pull in Samsonite bag. I was like, that is so crazy that you got all of that in this bag. But anyway, he was very proud of himself. So got all that and then he was like, and I just, I'm going to carry my computer with him so that he can do work on his day back when he comes back. So anyway, yeah. Um, and he downloaded all of Dahmer because he said he's going to watch that tonight like while he's sitting in the airport and on his way out there and all that kind of stuff. All right, you guys. Um, he was like, I, I said, did you pick your seat already? And he goes, yeah. And I said, did you fly first class? And he goes, no. And I go, and he goes, why? And I go, I would. He goes, you would. I go, if I was flying by myself to San Diego, like, and having like a little weekend bachelor getaway, you better bet your ass I would fly first class out there. I would recline the seat. I'd be watching the movies. I'd be eating the candies. I'd be having the whole fun. Anyway... Um, but sometimes, like, this is the thing. With the flights today, they're so damn expensive. But, like, some flights back in the day, like, they really, like, to upgrade would only be, like, you know, 50 or 100 bucks. They really weren't that bad. Especially, like, when the flights were kind of empty. I'm sure today, like, 
who was telling me the other day, I think it was Tanya Jean was telling me that flights are so, so expensive. So I'm sure first class tickets are through the roof. But anyway, all right, you guys, I can't believe I almost made it to a, a, a an hour. So I'm going to get off here now. Um, I hope that you guys, can you believe it? This is an hour. I haven't made an hour long vlog. It's been a long time, you guys. Oh, this has been so much fun tonight. Um, thank you for helping me get started on my bachelor weekend. Boo and Peter's bachelor. It stopped for the second time. That means it's an hour. Anyway, I hope that you guys are having a magically amazing Friday and a uh, fantastically wonderful beginning to your weekend. And if nobody else told you this, if nobody else has told, if nobody, if nobody else has told you this today, I love you. I love you. And remember these three very important things. One, you can start your day over whenever you want. I don't want to put my finger in front of my face or up my nose. <laughs> Two, practice random acts of kindness, but don't, shh, don't tell anyone. And three, most important, make sure, I almost forgot again, make sure <clears throat> to reach out to somebody and let them know how much they mean to you. And um, uh, also, uh, be kinder to one another. Uh, what do I say a little bit more? Be kinder to one, <laughs> I can't remember anything. Be kinder to one another, love each other a little bit more, and most importantly, be kinder and love yourself a little bit more. And I love you guys so much. Thank you for sitting out on the front porch with my glider and me and my pumpkin spice cold brew. And I love you. And I will see you tomorrow. Bye. Love you. And for those that need to hear it and those that want to hear it and those that just happen to stick around. One more I love you. I love you guys. I'll see you tomorrow. Bye. Love you. Happy birthday, Lena.